Hello, I'm Kevin Fernando, a GP working near Edinburgh in Scotland and content advisor for Medscape Global and UK. Welcome to our podcast, Medical Mentor, a bite-sized regular chat for all of us working in primary care. Podcasts will cover hot topics, practice pearls and hacks, as well as pitfalls to avoid, helping make our lives a little bit easier in primary care, but ultimately to help improve the lives of our patients. So Laura is a 34-year-old nurse who consults you in clinic as she's waking frequently through the night with aching and jumpy legs. She often has to get out of bed to walk and stretch her legs to relieve her symptoms. As a result of this ongoing sleep disturbance, Laura feels tired all the time and is struggling fulfilling her work commitments. So Laura likely has a diagnosis of restless leg syndrome or RLS. What do we need to know about RLS in primary care? RLS, also known as Willis-Eckbaum disease, is common in primary care. For some, it's a simple annoyance. For others, symptoms are more severe and affect their quality of life and sleep. And it is these individuals that we often see in clinic. Prevalence of RLS is estimated at 5 to 10% of European and North American adults, and 2 to 3% of these individuals suffer moderate to severe symptoms significantly impacting their quality of life. Women are twice as affected as men, and the average age of diagnosis is the fourth decade, so just like Laura. A positive family history is also very common, occurring in over 50% of cases. RLS is characterized by an overwhelming urge to move the legs with associated discomfort. These symptoms are partially or totally relieved by movement. It usually occurs in the evenings or at night and can be accompanied by abnormal sensations such as burning or tingling, or occasionally individuals may describe the sensation of insects crawling under their skin. Importantly, some people will not present with these classic symptoms and may present just with sleep disturbance or restlessness at night. So do inquire about symptoms of RLS in any sleep-related consultations. The pathophysiology of RLS has not been fully elucidated, but it is related to iron and dopaminergic pathways in the brain. Differential diagnoses to consider include nocturnal leg cramps, where there are sudden, involuntary, and painful muscle contractions affecting the legs, and is usually unilateral. We also need to exclude peripheral neuropathy, which has multiple etiologies, including diabetes, alcohol excess, certain medications, and vitamin B12 deficiency. Hypnic jerks can also mimic RLS. These are sudden jerking movements as you are about to drop off to sleep. And peripheral vascular disease also needs excluded, though as we all know, intermittent claudication is usually related to exercise and not generally worse in the evenings or at night. Finally, it is important to exclude akathisia. The word akathisia is derived from the Greek for inability to sit and is a feeling of inner restlessness and the inability to sit, stand, or lie still for a reasonable period of time. It is often associated with the use of antipsychotic medication, and symptoms bear no relation to the time of day. RLS is predominantly primary or idiopathic, but can also be secondary to certain conditions. The three commonest secondary causes of RLS are iron deficiency, pregnancy, and end-stage kidney disease. Around one in four people with RLS have iron deficiency, but not all people with iron deficiency have RLS. Current recommendations suggest investigating for a cause of iron deficiency if serum ferritin is less than 50 to 75 micrograms per liter, and we should prescribe iron supplements uh, as appropriate. Remember, if we are prescribing iron for iron deficient anemia, one tablet daily of an oral iron preparation is sufficient. If this is not tolerated, reduce the dose to one tablet on alternate days or consider an alternative preparation. Remember, 
Ferrous fumarate contains more elemental iron, 65 milligrams per tablet, than ferrous sulfate, 60 milligrams. So it's unlikely to be better tolerated. Secondly, RLS affects up to one in four pregnancies and tends to worsen as pregnancy progresses, but then settles spontaneously after delivery. Thirdly, RLS affects around one in five of those with end-stage kidney disease on dialysis, and there is a relationship between RLS symptoms and length of time on dialysis. Finally, RLS can be secondary to certain neurological conditions, including Parkinsonism and multiple sclerosis, and certain medications, including antidepressants, such as the SSRIs and SNRIs, Plochloprerazine and antihistamines too. Secondary RLS can also be associated with vitamin B12 and folate deficiency, as well as caffeine, alcohol, and chocolate excess. So how do we manage RLS in primary care? We need to identify and correct secondary causes of RLS where possible, as I've just discussed. We should assess severity of symptoms using our clinical judgment or a validated score, such as the International RLS Study Group Severity Scale, which can be found online. For those with mild symptoms, we should reinforce lifestyle advice and simple strategies to manage symptoms during an attack. Lifestyle advice includes good sleep hygiene, reducing caffeine and alcohol consumption, stopping smoking, and undertaking regular moderate intensity exercise. Simple strategies to relieve an episode of RLS include walking and stretching and massage of the affected limbs, use of heat with heat pads or a hot bath, or relaxation exercises. For those with moderate to severe symptoms, significantly impacting quality of life, we should also reinforce lifestyle advice and simple strategies to relieve symptoms, but we should also consider medication. First-line pharmacological options for people with frequent or disabling symptoms of RLS are either a dopamine agonist such as pramipexole, ropinarol, or reticotine, or a gabapentinoid, either pregabalin or gabapentin. But note, these latter two options are off-label indications. We should no longer offer opioids for the treatment of RLS. Now, there's been a real shift away from the use of dopamine agonists over the years due to augmentation of symptoms, loss of efficacy, and the risk of impulse control disorders. Augmentation is where symptoms of RLS are worsened with longer-term use of dopamine agonists. Symptoms can occur earlier in the day, are increased in intensity, and can spread to the arms or trunk. Augmentation can develop months or even years after treatment is started. It affects around 7% of those on dopamine agonists for RLS. Augmentation is associated with higher doses of dopamine agonists, so we should use the lowest dose to improve quality of life, but this may not necessarily eradicate symptoms. We can also consider as required dosing of dopamine agonists or long acting dopamine agonists such as retigotine patches to reduce the risk of augmentation. Long acting dopamine agonists are also useful for those with significant daytime symptoms due to their long duration of action. Also, we can consider regular trials of dose reduction or frequent drug holidays to minimize the risk of augmentation. Loss of efficacy is also commonly seen in long-term treatment of RLS. Over time, the drug dose often needs to be increased to maintain the original effect on symptoms. Finally, treatment with dopamine agonists has a well-established association with impulse control disorders, including pathological gambling, binge eating, and hypersexuality. Impulse control disorders occur in around one in five people with RLS who take dopamine agonists and is common in women, those on higher doses, and in those with a history of illicit drug use or a family history of gambling disorders. We need to warn individuals about the risk of an impulse control disorder and actively inquire about symptoms at each review consultation. 
However, we are stuck between a rock and a hard place, aren't we? As gabapentinoids are also not without their significant adverse effects, including dizziness, sedation, increased appetite and weight gain, as well as suicidal thoughts and behavior. Furthermore, pregabalin and gabapentin are controlled drugs in the United Kingdom with potential for misuse, abuse, and harm. So first-line choice of medication for RLS should be individualized according to symptoms, comorbidities, and potential side effects. A dopamine agonist is preferable for more severe symptoms in people who are living with obesity or overweight, who have comorbid depression or cognitive impairment, or who are at an increased risk of falls. Whereas a gabapentinoid is preferred first line for those with significant sleep disturbance, comorbid anxiety or pain, or a history of an impulse control disorder. So for Laura, history and examination was strongly suggestive of restless leg syndrome. Bloods revealed a ferritin level above 75 micrograms per liter. However, symptoms were having a significant impact on her quality of life and work. I reinforced lifestyle advice and discussed simple strategies for symptom management. However, given her occupation as a nurse, she was perturbed by the possible symptoms of dizziness and sedation, as well as weight gain with the gabapentinoids, so we opted for a dopamine agonist. Lowest dose pramipexol to be taken two to three hours before bedtime, as required in the first instance, to minimize the risk of augmentation. So. To finish a quality improvement activity for us all in primary care, how many of our patients with RLS have had their ferritin levels checked? So thank you all for listening. I hope you found this podcast helpful. Please do listen to our future Medical Mentor podcast, which will be available on all major platforms. Follow me on X, formerly Twitter, at Dr. Kevin Fernando, or email me on kfernando at webmd.net if you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future podcasts. Thank you again for listening.